um, clearly I'm going to fail. Um, because a 50 year old, and I'm not age discriminating, I'm facts. A 50 year old, even though I have my cute little not, you know, remote earbuds and I've got this thing, I'm, I'm, my kids make fun of me all the time, all the time because it takes forever. But I try to just be real, hire people who are better than me, and praise people, not unnecessarily, but like give them props. Like people need to be, to be praised. People need to know that they're doing a good job. People need to know that they're accepted, that, that what they did, that lo- tape, or see now I'm saying tape, that uh, file okay. that they I logged. I do it all the time. It's fine. My class will yeah. tell you that, that this is what I do. I will say tape, roll tape, confirm speed. <laughs> Like I said so right. last night, uh, when I say roll tape confirmed speed, I said it's also the only time in your career where you could say we have speed and not get yourself in trouble for it. Uh, <laughs> right. it exactly. I do do exactly. that. But I mean, I think there's a lot of mundane positions, especially in entry-level positions as a production assistant, as an intern, as an uh, executive assistant where you're stuck doing these really shitty jobs, you know, because you're you're paying your dues. Like, you know, whether it's logging a 45-minute interview and transcribing it word for word for your producer or editor, um, you know, and you could be up till four in the morning. And it's nice to get even the simplest acknowledgements. Like, dude, I know you were up till four in the morning last night. Come Come in tomorrow at noon or whatever. Like, that goes a long way because then your team knows that you recognize their value you've given them a minute to acknowledge it um and it sparks a relationship with the boss and everybody on every level and in turn your team then wants to work harder because anyone i've ever worked for who has been an asshole who's been like that ego like insecure i'm not going to give you credit everything's my idea or i'm going to tell you to pitch me 10 things and then i'm going to own them as my ideas when i talk to my boss oh hell no 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 that no that doesn't work because really quickly you're going to learn in a crisis situation when you need your team to have your back if you don't put your shit aside and your insecurities and your own ego and you don't build up your team and make them feel like they're a part of a team and a, a community working towards a common goal and you don't practice what you preach or do the best you can and apologize when you fall off the pedestal and when you do something inappropriate you are not going to you're not going to succeed and the only reason i have a job now and i'm well maybe not the only reason but like the big, big part of the reason I have a job now is because I have my, my reputation, thank God, is pretty decent based on word of mouth from people who've worked with me. So, you know, if I was an egomaniacal, well, I am a control freak. I definitely am a control freak. You can't be a producer and not be a control freak. Exactly. Sorry, you just can't. Right. Um, and, and in a way, we we could talk about that too, but in a way it's kind of, it's just a a necessary evil, but you don't have to be a douchebag. You don't have to be a mean person and point out other people's flaws to make you and your insecurity feel better. Like that's not the recipe for success that I, I like. And so whenever I meet somebody on like a junior level, if they've worked with part of my, my team, and you, you guys are going to make fun of me so bad, but I'm going to let you in on a stupid secret. My team, when I was at Fuse, there was one point where I had built up an in-house production team of about, uh, I don't know, give or take like 50 freelancers. And we had at one point like a, a bunch of shows in production, and it was really chugging along, and it was really cool. And, and I was like looking for ways to make the team feel, you know, together. And we do all these like, show and tell things where people would show like what what projects they've been working on and and then it gave everyone a chance to celebrate it um we called we changed the we we coined the name back in the day there was this group that diddy uh managed called diddy dirty money i think it was and they changed it to demi dirty money and so we were known as the demi dirty money posse at fuse we even created our own logo everyone had a dirty name I was ODB because I was the oldest in the head. So I was old, dirty bastard. Um, And everyone kind of adopted these names. And it was so corny and stupid, but 
everyone else on the, the news team, so we were production, so there was the news team who unfortunately was managed by a not so nice person for all the reasons I explained. They would come over to our team and be like, how can I be part of Demi Dirty Money? And it's because they didn't respect their boss and, and because their boss let ego get into it. So I know that's not answering the question, how do you manage egos? But for me, I think it's almost more important to try to get you guys to think along, you know, you're not going to be a production assistant or a junior writer or an entry level thing for long. Eventually you're going to be in David's position. You're going to be in my position. You're going to be in, you know, Sue, who was on the calls position or bigger and better. And I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't say that I really feel like my team and the word of mouth from my team telling others that it's okay to work for me and with me is what has gotten me work and sustained my career. And so, sure, it's feel good it, and it is self-serving, but it, I can sleep at night knowing that I've encouraged an environment of creativity of where people don't have to feel like I have a shitty title idea, so I'm not going to throw it out. Any idea can spark a better idea. There are no bad ideas. There are. I mean, there are, but, but the bad ideas spark good ideas, you know? So I've just yeah. tried within my power to, to manage like that. And um, you're going to come up against people like my former colleague who wasn't such a nice person who then starts office politics and starts to talk shit about you and your team and, and all this poison, right? And I'll be honest, sometimes you win those arguments. And that other person gets reprimanded or gets let go or whatever. And sometimes you lose. Like when I alluded to earlier that tenure at Fuse, when I, you know, I started there in 2002 and um, I got laid off in 2008, right as the mortgage crisis hit and everybody was getting out of work and I got laid off. Why did I get laid off? Not for performance, not for not delivering on my goals, not for any of that shit. It was purely political because my boss above me, who ran the network at the time, was sparking a, um, not sparking, was, was fostering a combative environment and not a collaborative environment. And, and this person was pitting development against production against news and seeing who could win. And um, it, I finally, after a while, I was like, I'm not wasting my time on this tool who doesn't know what they're talking about, this colleague of mine, um, who I clearly know I'm, I, in my world, I'm just as qualified, if not more. So I'm not going to worry about him. And I just kept doing my own thing and I made no apologies. And I stood up for my team and I stood up for myself and it got me laid off. Or and be, yeah. Was it you know what? You felt better about yourself and that's most, most important. Well, in, in your way. it took a while, Dave. It took yeah. a while because I'll be honest with you. The problem about somebody like me, somebody who is passionate and, you know, emotional, good and bad and an advocate, I, I really feel like I, I will always try to advocate for my team if I feel like it's warranted and defend them to my own fault. Um, and I'll still, I'll, I'll still do that. Um, but the point is that when it happened, I knew it was complete BS. They, they towed the company line, then they said, you know, your position's being eliminated, you know, which is legal, a legal loophole, let's say. Um, if, they, if they get rid of your position and you haven't done anything wrong, it's justifiable. Right. So, um, but I knew exactly what was going on. And I, because I was so driven to, and poured my life, literally, at my own, to my own personal life at this advantage, poured my life into my job and trying to prove myself at Fuse and overcome all this other crap. It got me, when I did get laid off, not only did I take it incredibly personally, holy shit, I was like, oh my God. I, I felt like my world came to a close because I knew I was neglecting other parts of my life, pouring it into this. I knew it wasn't healthy. I was trying to fix the problem and the problem was way above my head and I was stupid enough to think and maybe egomaniacal enough to think that I could affect some, some change. And um, it took a while for me, man, that Long Island Railroad train ride home that day, 
after I got escorted to the elevator by HR. Dude, it, it was, and I had to lie to my team because they were all like, what's going on? And I was like, I have to go across the street to the garden for a meeting. Uh, I'll be back in an hour. And I was like choking the tears back. And I could see in their eyes, they knew I was lying. And, it, and when I got on the train, man, it was brutal. But the learning experience from that was I needed to get a thicker skin. I needed to learn not to succumb to the politics because I, by the time I backed off, it was too late. I was already identified as a troublemaker who's not, you know, doing whatever it was. The irony is I left. Um, I will give props to Fuse and the Madison Square Garden. They gave me a good exit package. I had to fight for it, but they gave me a good exit package. Again, self-advocate. Right. Self-advocate. That's a whole other thing. Um, I realized that I needed a thicker skin in this business. And again, it wasn't until about a year ago when I finally realized that a lot of things that I get upset at at my job, even now with my current boss, who I love dearly as a human being, um, but isn't the strongest manager. He's just not. Um, I learned that it's not what's wrong with me. It's just, this is the style and the kind of person this person is. And it's how I respond to it. Mm -hmm. And that's been years and years of practice and failing. And because my first initial reaction is if you come at me and you threaten me or the people I care about, whether it's my team or my family, I'm coming, I'm coming harder. And that's immature. <laughs> but, and, and it's instinctual. Thank you. Uh, I, we have another question coming up from one of uh, yeah. people from one of my teams, my Terry TV team. Uh, David, who's actually co-producing this with me right now, is helping me out. Hey, David. Uh, Going to have David come on here, David? Sure. Yep. You're loud and clear. Thanks so much, Jen, for all your advice and all your help. Um, really appreciate it. Of course. And just uh, my question um, is, how would you describe the transition from college student to uh, director, or filmmaker, or producer? Um, what would you suggest are the next steps? Okay. Um, well, there's certainly no blueprint, right? I mean, you guys can. You know, you hear stories from people all the time about, uh, you know, the path that they chose and stuff like that. I think part of it is, um, without getting corny and philosophical on the universe, or and I'm not getting into religion, obviously, but like, for me, I personally feel like um, you're given, we all know life takes turns in weird directions that we never either want or could have anticipated, but part of that is, kind of not trying to control every step of your life out of college. Cause again, that's what I've done. I've tried to be a control freak on everything. And then I get really frustrated when things don't go my way or the way that I think they should go, you know, like I graduate college, I'm going to get an internship or I'm going to get a PA job and then I'm going to work my way up nice and neatly to producer. And then I'm going to, you know, like it doesn't work that way. It never did. You know, maybe for some people it does, but it doesn't. So I'm not going to begin to pretend to tell you that there is um, a specific blueprint, but what I will say is, um, I'm just trying to think the most, the best quick advice to give. I would say it, it, it starts also with really, it kind of goes back to what I was saying about like knowing your own ego, knowing what's, what, what makes you tick. What, what are the things that, get you excited? What are the um, topics, the things that make you passionate and therefore stimulate you creatively? You know, um, I think you've got to get in touch with that first because there are so many directions you can go in, right? I mean, especially now with the digital world and the social world. I mean, it's amazing. So I feel like Especially somebody, I don't know if you know, David, do you know which direction you want to go in? Because I, I just assume that most young people don't really know where they, which part of the business they want to go in. But do you? I have to open his mic. He's turned himself down. Hold on one second. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So maybe he wants to be a director and that's why he asked that question. He likes yeah. behind the yeah, scenes. Yeah, definitely. To, definitely behind the scenes work, filmmaking, uh, you know, directing movies. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, I think, well, since you know what you want, I would say, um, do you want to direct films? 
Do you want to direct music videos? Do you want to direct reality series? Do you want to direct live news? Like, do you have an idea of the type of directing you want to do? Because again, there's no one size fits all, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I'd say I definitely prefer, uh, you know, films like motion pictures, uh, you know, filmmaking, okay. that, kind of, that kind of thing. Yeah. Ken, your, your brother, Wait. I was going to say, your brother has done music videos. I know you worked on some of the sets with him on the music videos. Uh, and then he transitioned over to feature film. Do you have any comments on that one? Yeah, that, no, that's, and that's probably the best and the smartest way for me to um, give advice is through what I witnessed through my brother. Because while, look, I tout myself as a producer first and foremost. Um, certainly being a producer, you have to watch his foot, watch his foot, sorry. Um, being a producer, you have to direct a lot of times, depending on the, the shows. Um, however, feature film directing is a whole other ball of wax. And um, so from watching my, like a case study on my brother, who, like I said, started at TV, started in promos at MTV, then became a show producer, series producer, um, events guy, whatever, <clears throat> and then moved on into film. His thing was he, he said, okay, I need, to, I think I'm going to try to go into film. What do I, and I want to be a director. So I think it starts with, well, and this goes to what one of the earlier questions is about the side hustle. I know I'm not going to get hired by a studio or a producer or a network fresh out of college, having never directed anything, right? Like that's pretty logical. So what's the next best thing? I'm going to, I'm going to find a way to direct my own film and it's going to be a short film. It doesn't have to be feature length and cost thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, especially in this age where you can shoot a film on your iPhone, you could, sh or whatever phone you have, and you can edit it on your laptop. You know what I mean? There's like so many opportunities that are open now to filmmakers, whether they're writers like Aaliyah or directors like you, um, that to get that experience, even if you don't know what you're doing is so important because then even if it's awful, you know, and it's cause trust me, I can, I'm already thinking about the things I worked on. Uh, I produced a short film as well. Uh, when I was dabbling in film as a set PA as a way for me to figure out, is this something I'm really good at? Is this something I want to do? And I very quickly realized this is awful and I hate it because I was chasing people for money all the time and yelling at everyone to stay on schedule. But, it was valuable because it was part of what made me realize, man, I miss TV. I miss the immediacy of TV. I miss producing and feeling, you know, I've worked my ass off to get to be a producer and this was just not going to work. So for you as a director, and that's why I'm asking about passion points, because I think most directors will say, I got pulled into this project because this script spoke to me or this or I wrote this script screenplay because I had this thing that I had to get off of my head, you know, the story or whatever. So it starts with no matter whether you're a music video director, a feature film director, a podcast producer, director, anything that involves creating content, whether it's scripted news, reality, music, sports, fill in the blank, pottery, animals, like you could create content on anything. Find what makes you passionate. What are the stories? Find, it's all about storytelling at the end of the day. It really is, whether it's a 10 second story or a two hour story. And find, find out what are the things that push your creative juices, get you passionate, get you excited, so that you can then tell that story through the lens or your smartphone or whatever it is. Because as a director, you are the top of the food chain next to the executive producers, the studio heads and all that stuff. But when it comes to coming to a set, it's the director's set. It's not the producer's set. It's not the assistant director's set. It's not, you know, Miramax or what used to be Miramax or whatever. It's, I mean, ultimately it is Miramax, but you know what I mean. As a department head, Everybody on a film set, whether it's a commercial, a music video, or a feature film, looks to the director. The director calls the shots. 
on everything, whether they want 10 more takes, whether they need to stop down and fix something, whether they need to direct the coach, the, the actor who may be giving them a hard time, whatever it is, whether it's raining, it's a sunny night, we're losing light or a sunny night, sorry, sorry, sunny day, or it's five in the morning, this is a night shoot, we're losing light. What do you want to do? Everyone's looking at the director. So you not only have to be good and okay at making decisions, without fear of it being the wrong decision. Um, because at the end of the day, everybody is waiting for you to make that decision. But at the, at the beginning of the process, you have to have something that you're passionate about, a story that you're passionate about telling, whether it's your own story or a story that you discover or something that inspires you to do more digging and doing a documentary, unscripted. So that's what I would suggest. And I know that's not, it's not a, a clear path, but I think, like I said, you're, no one's going to hire you as a director out of college. They're just not. So either you have to roll the dice and pray that you fall into, a, you know, hog heaven and you actually come up with something or align yourself with something that is a huge viral hit, social hit, theatrical hit, which we all know that rarely happens. It happens, but it rarely happens. Um, or you try to do two paths at the same time. As a director, start pursuing those projects that make your creative juices flow, that you get excited about, and, and find a way to align yourselves with like-minded people in the same circumstance you're in, like the Jamillas of the world who want to write screenplays or scripts for award shows or whatever. You need a writer? You know Jamilla? You kind of like her sensibility? share the concept with her. She's equally as excited. She's now going to help you write the script. Okay, I got my writer now. Who's going to shoot it? Who's going to light it? Like you find people who are at the same point in their lives and careers as you are, who may have to take a day job that sucks to pay your bills while you do your side hustle and get something together that you could share and learn from. And the other thing I would say, and then I'll shut up on this, is. Um, Go on, God, I should have come equipped with this too, and I will find out what the best ones are if you guys don't know. Whatever websites for um, production jobs. And uh, it used to be, uh, what the hell was it? The one I always used to go on. Uh, I can't remember it. But anyway, I'll, one of those sites. I will post that up for you. You'll send me the link and I will. Let Once I remember it, yeah. Um, but it, it's everything from like, you know, we need a driver PA, you know, to go haul equipment from, it's crappy jobs, right? But I would say, like, get in, if, if get in and apply for as many entry level day jobs, they could be just day jobs, like one shoot that they need a PA for, or one shoot that they need a utility um, who works with the camera department. Like, find those opportunities where even if it's the furthest thing from your mind and you're like, this is going to suck, but it's going to get me on a set. And it may not give me the opportunity I'm looking for, for me as a director, but I'm now going to go onto this set knowing that I have to do a job for this project, but I'm also going to open my eyes and look at the director. I'm going to watch what the director does. I'm going to watch what his first AC does. I'm going to watch what his focus puller does, if you're lucky enough to work on a film film, which is rare nowadays, or whatever it is. And just observe what they do. Meet them during a meal break. Hey, just get to know them. And then at, over time, you say, hey, look, I'm, I've been, I can't lie. I want to do what you guys do. Can you give me advice? Advice leads into what, you, what you're just saying to me. Is there any gig or anyone you guys know looking for whatever on a camera department for a longer term project for a week shoot or a month shoot? Or dare I, could I be so bold as to see if I could be an intern for the camera department on a feature film? Like those are the, the avenues to try to explore. Like try not to let a job right now just because it's not a, in with the camera department deter you from trying to apply for it to get your 
foot on the set. Because once you get your foot on the set, a whole other world opens up. If you're not an asshole, if you, hu- if you hustle hard, you are respectful, you do your job first, you don't, I know I don't have to tell you guys this, but the first thing that any of my colleagues will say, if they're expecting somebody to be paying attention on a set, I better not see anybody on their fucking phones. Like, when we're locking up a set, you, not only is your phone like not on you, or it could be on you, but it's on mute. It's in your back pocket. If I see any PA locking up a corner, like a busy street in New York City to try to prohibit people from coming into the shot, and I see them on their social media, automatic firing. Jen, could you no please, second chances. Jen, could you please repeat that for my class? And I want to use that when they try to text underneath the tables. Uh, please. <laughs> I, I totally yeah. Totally use that. Okay, Dave, is, that, is your question answered? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Dan. Oh. Yeah, that really cool, man. Out. No problem. Best of luck. Best of luck. Find the stories you're passionate about. Create those stories and then shoot them. Even if it's just you with your camera and nobody else, start there and, and go from there and see what happens. And be open to the possibilities and try to be patient because this kind of a career does not happen overnight. It's years of hustle, years of blood, sweat, and tears, year, uh, moments where you're saying, like, I'm, this isn't worth it. This is so not worth it, especially if you work for an idiot or an asshole or somebody you don't respect or whatever. Um, but always try to find the opportunity in a bad situation for you. Even if it's just, I got to figure out how to manage my game face because I'm sitting here rolling my eyes, listening to this idiot talk BS but I can't let everyone else in the room know that I'm onto him. Or you know what I mean? Like even stupid little things like that. Um, those are life skills that you can apply to any job. And um, yeah, and that's what I recommend. Jen, Thank, you so next, much, Jen. Thank you. Jen, next person we have on the uh, coming up is Mahalia. Mahalia, you're on the air. Hi, Jen. Um, thank Hi. you so much for um, coming to talk to us. This is really great. And I feel like um, everything that you're saying so much, like so far, has been like a godsend. Everything is just so right on the wow. money. And it's, no, seriously, it's, it's, it's great to hear. Oh, that means a lot to me. Thank you. You guys are awesome. You're giving me such an ego boost. Speaking of <laughs> egos, <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Um, so you kind of sort of answered my question in the last question. But um, okay. I'm go ahead and ask another one because um, yeah, I wanted to know once you get your foot in the door or you at least get the seat at the table at some point, and even right, you probably progress from a PA to the next possible higher up position, maybe an assistant or something. How soon is too soon to pitch um, your show idea or your or to even have a creative <laughs> input at that point? And how when and how That's do you? That's a great question. What was the second part and how do I what? How are you, how do you overcome um, the anxiety of, of, or fear that, you're, that your pitch would not be good enough? Yeah, dude, I hear that. Um, that's a great question. Um, I can give you kind of an illustration of like in the context of MTV because that's probably the easiest thing for me to do. Because okay. each, each work environment, as we know, is different, right? Some cultures, uh, will say, you know, again, culturally ego, there are egos on a cultural level so in, a, in a business. So if the business can't get past its own ego to say like, no idea is bad idea, um, we will take ideas from anybody and everybody if they get the brand. You know, some places are embracing of that like MTV and, and I'm proud to say that. Um, and others, I would imagine, aren't. Um, and I think the reason why MTV has always been embracing of that is because it's a young brand. It's, it's supposed to, when I say young, sorry, young skewing culture, like youth culture is, you know, I hate, I hate that term too, but it's like, again, like I said earlier, like I'm trying to get my mission and my boss's mission is not only to try to bring music back to places that don't have kind of pushed it out of the brand in different territories, especially the U S um, but also to, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought, not only bring it to places that don't, but elevate it, elevate the percentage of music to reality content, right? So, but 
because MTV has always been known for, like, it's been the Ted Demis of the world who were the PA pitching a show that becomes an iconic show. Why? Because he's the audience. He was 22. So, you know, for me, I would be an idiot and MTV would have closed up shop a long time ago if they turned their back on the younger you are in a way, the better. Like I would almost say like, I mean, and again, not to, not to age discriminate against people older than 30, but in a weird way, it's like if I had one hour to take pitches and I had my choice to take a pitch from somebody your age or somebody closer to my age, I hate to say it. I'm going to go with somebody your age because you theoretically are the audience I'm trying to reach. You are the one living. I need you to tell me what I should be putting on MTV so that it's relevant to you, so that you want to, to watch, so that you want to consume the content. So for me in MTV, there is no um, level. You could be an assistant. You could be an intern. You could be the president of the company. Pitches are welcome. Um, so that's number one, at least for me. I can't speak to other brands. It really comes down to, like, I think the thing I'm starting to realize as I'm telling you guys all this is when you do have opportunities to interview somewhere or you want to, like, you know, whether it's the um, ESPNs, like we were talking about earlier, um, know that brand. Know what you're trying to get yourself into. And when I say that, and again, I hate the word brand, but I don't know how else to say it. Know the company. Know the. Try to do some research on not just like the kinds of shows they have or you know the obvious stuff, but like try to look for trends. Meaning like you know these types of hosts are or talent are the kinds of people that this brand aligns itself with. Why? Like what do I see that might be common to that? Or here's the kind of content that they have. Like the reason I say that is the more that you can try to get your head around what that company thinks it is, and I'll get to that in a second, or, or says it is today, because every day brands evolve, and MT, MTV is like the poster child for that. I mean, it has been hard for me to follow a mandate for development more than three to six months at a time, because in the past, MTV has been very reactionary in the last couple of years to like, oh, this show doesn't work, pull it, try something else, instead of trying to like figure out maybe bigger reasons why that content may not be working. <coughs> Excuse me. No, <laughs> I knew this was gonna happen. You can go you can go back for a while. I have to give you credit. Sorry. It's okay. Happens all the time. I, you did, I, I can't <laughs> bottle this long without taking a drink. I'm extremely impressed. I drank a half a bottle of water while you were going. <laughs> I told you I talk a lot. Talk too much. Nah, you don't talk. <laughs> Almost done. I appreciate anyway. it. <clears throat> no, no problem. So, <clears throat> sorry, just bear with me. As I cry. Um, so, know the, the brand. <clears throat> and, and the reason for that is it may skew the um, <clears throat> angle of your pitch. And so, for example, you're coming to MTV and you're like, I want to pitch Jen a music show. A lot of development teams actually have a mandate on, in a PowerPoint that they use to send out to people to basically say, here's what we're looking for. So people like producers that pitch ideas, or not even producers, everyday people, We'll look at that mandate ideally and say, oh, all right, I wanted to pitch a reality series, but Jen's team is just looking for music. And even more so, they don't want documentaries because they need content on the air quickly. They need to do this. So how do you normally, normally won't get that information without looking at a mandate first and foremost, or here's another idea. <coughs> there are things that there are different types of pitch meetings. Sorry, wow, this itch will not go away. Different types of pitch meetings. There's um, what we call generals, like general meetings, which production companies or individual producers will come to us 
and say, hey, we want to do business with you. We think we have some cool ideas. We think uh, the kinds of content and the shows that we've done work well for the types of shows you guys do. You know, maybe they're live event producers or concert directors or whatever it may be. So it's what most people will say is, but before we pitch you our ideas, we need to know what you're looking for. And we'd love to get some more information from you about what is your mandate first? What are you looking to buy? What show ideas are you looking for? And more importantly, what aren't you looking for? So we'll set up, my colleague Amanda and John, will set up those generals with um, either individual producers and production companies, or if they're represented by agencies like ICM or CAA or all the talent agencies, the agent will set up that call. So the agent can hear it and they'll bring their creatives on to hear from the network what it is they're all like who they are what they're buying what they're all about so it helps somebody before they even formally pitch an idea ah okay so these five ideas i had those won't work because i wanted concerts and they just told me concerts are not on their uh, mandate because they need something that's going to get a better rating and live music on linear television doesn't rate so, oh, I'm glad I found that out before I pitched this concert. But, when, and this is what I mean about pivoting your pitch. Let's say you wanted to pitch a concert to me and, and I quickly told you, like, don't even bother, right? We're not looking. And we have all these other shows. Um, instead of going, ah, let me just throw that idea in the garbage and now I guess I have nothing to talk to Jen about. Maybe there's a part of that show that you wanted to pitch that involves something that isn't live concerts. For example, maybe before a commercial or part of that show, you're doing something unique and different that involves like taking that artist out of the live performance space and doing a walk and talk interview or a package on them or something that doesn't hinge on that live concert. Maybe you can identify those parts of the other elements of the show and maybe say, well, knowing what I know now, about what they don't want and what they are looking for. Can I tweak these ideas and think out of the box a little bit differently? Not be so precious, that's another thing. Don't be too precious about your ideas because chances are somebody's already thought of it and you just don't know it yet. And secondly, if it gets shot down, and this goes back to your anxiety question, <clears throat> if it gets shot down, you have to have a thick skin. You have to not make this about you as a person being shot down. It's the idea, simple, that's it. Because you gotta put yourself in the network's position, right? They're getting pitches all the time. Amanda and John, like half the reason I'm not involved in those anymore besides the fact that Amanda was hired specifically to run the day-to-day -day on development so that I could do yo across the globe and oversee all these other productions that are in motion now. So they get a ton of pitches, right? It's kind of like that question of how do I stand out among all these other interns or all these other people trying to get jobs? <clears throat> it's the people who can succinctly, very quickly, almost what we call a log line, which is basically a one or two sentence description of your show idea. Drill it down to that. And then when you can meet with, these, with, with the teams, the way it gets presented is, okay, I've got, I heard you on your mandate. I gave some more thought. I tweaked some of my ideas. I'm now going to present you very quickly just the log line. I'm not going to get into details. I'm not going to do a Gen Demi and talk eight hours about one show idea. I'm going to pitch you the log line and see if I can hook you in with the log line. Or, you know, and, and then you can say, oh, I'm interested in that. So let me ask you a few more questions. And then you can have a conversation about it. If the network wants more, they're interested, <clears throat> excuse me, interested, then they may ask you to draw up like a one sheet a creative description that might be a little bit more about what you're thinking about. What is the format? What is the show like? Is it this? Is it that? And then you can go into a follow up pitch. But the, the, the point is, in the whole trip, the pitch process is brutal. It's competitive. Um, most people do not come up with truly original ideas because 
it's been done before. Look at all the types of shows. Look at how like the masked singer is taking a cue from all these other, you know, music shows and the voice. It's like every network is scrambling to come up with their version of X, right? And so it's it's hard to have an original idea. Um, and it's okay not to have an original idea if you can create a spin on an existing idea that could make it unique to the network you're pitching it to. So in other words, what's MTV's version of The Mass Singer? How, wh- how can I pitch a show similar to MTV to The Mass Singer without it being that and having it feel like it truly belongs on MTV, right? Because Mass Singer feels very <clears throat> family oriented, broad, appealed to a large group of people. Whereas MTV might have that frat boy meets, you know, thrill seeker meets, you know, F you mom and dad meets like, you know, breaking the rules kind of vibe. So what kind of show, what, how do I take that format and elevate that into something that's unique to MTV where they'll get it right away and they may not like it, but they'll get it right away. And, and half of the, half of the battle that I find is, Finding people who truly <clears throat> do understand, sorry, now I've got light in my face, truly understand um, the music side of the MTV brand. And it's really sad because most people don't because it hasn't stood for music in so long, except for like the VMA, you know? Um, so we have to then teach or not teach, but explain to everybody constantly like, what our mantra is, what our mission is, is the music team, what kind of content feels MTV, what doesn't feel MTV. Um, And we have to constantly ask ourselves these questions as people who have a limited budget, believe it or not, on the international side versus the US. And we have to be really careful that the projects we choose are the ones that we think are gonna have the greatest chance for success based on our limited budget. So we have to constantly check ourselves on like, oh, wait, but we said we're not looking for this, so why are we entertaining this pitch when we know we're wasting everyone's time, you know? So that's part of the answer. The other part of the answer about the anxiety is just, um, I, can't, I can't sit here as somebody who suffers from anxiety, and I'm on medication for anxiety, truthfully, and I'm proud of it because it allows me to be functioning in a positive way, not a terrified, constant fear of, you know, am I good enough? And this idea is going to suck. And how am I going to present this? Well, but um, I think it only comes with volume of pitches, because just like on the network side, when they hear all these pitches, and they kind of glaze over, and it's like, uh, and there's, it takes a lot to impress somebody with a pitch. On the other side of the coin, you as the person doing the pitching will inevitably get a sense, you'll, you'll start getting numb. And you'll find yourself almost, not that you won't have insecurities or be worried or, you know, have your spidey sense up, but you'll, you'll, you'll have, you'll be so used to pitching this show or these types of shows that it's almost like what I'm doing now with you guys. Like I'm shooting from the hip here. I don't have a script in front of me. I should have put an agenda together because I would have. There is no script here. And that was the whole thing we talked about. We did this whole thing. I know. Yeah, um, I know, but I I didn't want to ramble on and go off into eight hundred directions, which I know I have. But, no, but I would just say very quick, very quick. Just the if you should hope that the anxiety never goes away, Mahalia, and I say that in the sense that it's a it's good to have a little bit of anxiety. It's good to have a it's good to be nervous because it just keeps that's what keeps you tapped into being a human being. And if your job is to sell an idea and you don't feel nerves or are tapped into this, then it's going to impact your pitching also for the negative. Because if you just become this rote, like, oh, I'm going to tell the story in my head and I'm just going to get it out with no emotion, like the network side feels that lack of excitement, you know, whereas if you're an idiot like me and you're like bouncing out of your skin like at least I'm going to get somebody's attention for 10 seconds (laughs) so 
Yeah. Okay. Mahal, you did uh, we answer your question on that? Or I should yes. say you answered it? <laughs> no, yes. <I'll>... <laughs> <laughs> Hold one second. I'm closing my other blind. Hold Thank on one you second. so much. Um, Thank you. Thank you. All right. By the way, everybody, thank you for asking all these questions. I really appreciate it. Um, this has been incredible. Right now, Jen. I can't believe I, it's 20 to 5. Holy you know, crap. Be off and I got <clears throat> one person, one more guest that's going to come on with us. And then, oh and then I got one last question. And uh, this is actually back from one of our people before. This is from Gabriella before, uh, who unfortunately okay. her, her um, headset died on her. So. Yes, we'd ask. Oh no! Questions. So uh, I will ask the question for you, then I'll say a quick wrap up after that. We're, and I know I don't want to make you lose your voice, and so you go later and all that. We have to sound like. <laughs> okay. Funny. Well, this this part, this person who I'm bringing <clears throat> up right now claims he has not spoken to you in thirty years. Okay. Thirty years. That person oh. probably is wearing the same T-shirt he wore thirty years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Not the same shirt, but the same group. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I love Rush. I love Rush. Wait, come closer. Which album cover is that? Or is it tour t-shirt? This is, this is, all right. <laughs> this is time yes. seven from the DVD 2016, after they broke up. Dude, I'm like, what? I'm Retire. looking at you because it's been a long time, man. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Good to see your face, man. Holy crap. This is amazing. And I just want to say to everyone listening and watching that um, Jen Dan and I, that's like Jen Dan, but it's one word. <laughs> um, went to Cortland together and we uh, were in the same hall, same floor, Higgins. Was it the same? Higgins Hall. Sixth floor, was it? Sixth floor, my first year, and then the fifth yeah. floor, yeah. Yeah, I remember, I remember the floor. Um, this will probably help everyone. Um, I, was talking, I was talking to Dan, though I'm not going to embarrass you. Well, maybe. Okay. Uh, I was actually talking to Dave last night, and with, you know, the Yankees, the virus, and everything. And then he said, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll send you this Zoom. Jen Dem is going to be on. I said, oh, this is great. And um, I said, and, I told him, and Dave will you know, verify this. I said, the, the thing I remember most about Jen is a smile all the time. Every single time. <laughs> every single time it was non stop. Yeah. So, I mean, the, 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 so let me chime in to, to all the students and everything. Um, because I remember it in you so well. It was optimism, 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 nonstop, all the time. And that's wow. that I remember from you from 30 years ago, and it's still there. And um, it's Thank you. Big. So that's, you know, that's what I remember, and it's still there. Thank you so much. You guys didn't make me cry. This is, I'm telling you, I'm getting a lot more out of this than anybody else is. Trust me. We got together um, to share this whole thing. Don't you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love that. That's so sweet of you to say, and I, I really appreciate that. Um, this is going to be airing on MTV. Yeah, you don't know. This is the next, by the way, this is the new reality show that it's going to be on MTV right now. <laughs> going on this was actually our pilot episode here uh that we've been talking about so uh Dave's gonna bring oh out my, the God. <laughs> my face hurts from smiling so much i'm literally like i can't believe you guys showed up this is so great <clears throat> thank I you sure and there, there were actually other people who were here unfortunately they were able to hold on uh i had um uh, dina was going to stop by uh, Aww. And, I was, and uh, there were other people who were supposed to come by, but they will. We know, make arrangements for CRP and all that real soon. Uh, so definitely. I, I wanted to ask you um, a quick thing ball before ball. we're done. Yeah, go ahead. Do we have Do we have time to? Um, I did want to no. just. Oh, my dog. Sorry, I I did want to um, play that one uh, reel just to show everybody. Um, I mean, whoever's left and has the patience to sit through this uh, at this point. 
um, that the first reel that I sent you. David, which one, which one was that? This way I'll have David. It was the one. Cued up. It should be the music shows reel, not the Yo reel, because Yo is incorporated into it. David, do you have that? David, you there? Yep. Yeah, I have it. I have the link here. I could post it in the chat. And also I downloaded it so I could post the file in the chat as well. All right. So the, the chat will be there. Um, there's no way of bringing that up um, on your page or not. Hang on one sec. Let me try. Again, this is the first time we're doing this. So we, this is really a yeah. real technical or not bad at uh, two hours and 47 minutes in. Great. I mean, again, if, if everyone wants to go, and I don't blame you at this point, if you do, um, it's fine. I just thought it might be a cool <clears throat> way to end, just to give everyone an illustration of um, the kinds of programs that the music team is doing internationally. And, you know, that includes Unplugged, it includes Yo, and a couple of other <clears throat> things. Um, it's just eye candy, but it's fun. I will have a disclaimer that this is a work in progress reel that I started months ago and then I had to put aside. Um, so it's, it's not cut to the music. I have a ton of criticisms with it. So don't judge me. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to turn the volume up. I'm going to try bringing this up right now. I'll see if I could, if it okay. works. If not, Professor, I think when you click the link, I think, and then you could click it full screen. And then for the Zoom meeting, you could click uh, something that says share screen because I'm not the host, so I can't. I'm trying to do that right now, Dave. Oh, right. Um, again, I'm trying to, oh, God. I'm still trying to do this here. Uh, hold on one second. I am share screen. Okay, I did that. Does everybody see that now? I, I can't tell. Uh, it's, I have nothing playing mm, right now. Yeah, I see the link. <clears throat> I'm trying to... I guess everyone could just... Oh, there it is. So it's before you press... I hear it. I'm logged in. Share I think I don't see it on the screen. Right, I'm going to have to share Oh, yeah. I hear it, but mm -hmm. I, I have it on my screen. I still have it on yours. Sorry about that. Let me wait. One more time. One more thing. Don't worry. Yes. No. Oh, there you go. That works. Yep. Oh, but it might be stepped. You know, it could be. Yeah. You know what, guys? You, you might as well stop it. Okay. Give me one second here. I'm gonna try to bring up my screen. Uh, give me a second here. New share. Let me see if I get out of here. Try to get back to this happens all the time when I'm on a call for MTV um, when we're trying to share video. If the Wi-Fi or the network isn't strong, um, it steps the video. So it's probably going to be more frustrating for anybody. You can and you don't have to watch it. I just thought it'd be a fun way to end the <clears throat> presentation. I got, I Hold got on, I'm letting my dog out. Okay, no problem. I got one last one sec. I have one last question for Jen. I'm going to wrap up here. Uh, okay, sure. One, Go one ahead. Question for you. This is back from Gabrielle. She asked me before, with the experiences you have now, what advice would you give your college self? Wow, that's some deep. Wow, man, this is going to be tough to. Uh, okay, with the experience I've had now, what would I tell my college self? <clears throat> okay. I'm just going to go off my gut here okay. with no order. I would say, trust your gut. Simply put, trust your gut. If something feels <clears throat> right, whether it's the right decision about something or it's a creative thing, then go for it. Even if you're terrified, if your gut is saying this is good or it's not good, listen to it. Because the few times that I, <laughs> second guess my gut in life and with work, um, I lived to regret it. I was like, damn it, I should have gone with my gut on that. And every time I did go with my gut, even though it was usually a huge leap of faith <clears throat> and I did a lot of praying, I was like, oh dear God, please don't let this be the production that everything falls apart. Like, <laughs> you know, please, you know, um, in hindsight, 
I look back and say, why did you lose so much sleep? Why did you smoke a pack of cigarettes in two hours because of your anxiety? Why did you, you know, all that stuff, because it works out. If you, if you, if you surround yourself with good people, um, and I don't just mean good people in the industry. I mean, good humans, good human beings <clears throat> who happen to also be people that are great at what they do. Observe, listen. That's a problem I have too. I tend to, when I'm listening to somebody say something, if I think I know how they're going to finish their sentence, but it takes them too long to do it because I'm too freaking impatient, I'll cut them off and like finish the sentence and half the time I'm wrong and then I piss them off. So it's like, listen, listen, slow, take it slow. Not everything has to be a race to the finish, like sprint. Patience is so hard, but sometimes when things don't go the way you want them to and you have yourself convinced that this is the only way it's going to work, it's the only way you're going to get a job, it's the only way you're going to do this show successfully or whatever, and it doesn't work out that way and all these monkey wrenches get thrown into the mix, <clears throat> don't do what I did and do, <laughs> which is, you know, stress out and freak out, like assess and think maybe there's a reason this is happening and I just haven't figured it out yet and allow for like the universe to present certain opportunities to you. They may not be the same perspective and that doesn't mean it's wrong. It could mean that you weren't thinking the right way and perhaps you should take a step back and just look at the situation and read it and really stay dialed into your gut because if you're trying to be somebody you're not if you're trying to whatever it's gonna it's gonna to those of us who are either experienced enough or intuitive enough, intuitive enough to recognize um that kind of bs um it's only gonna bite you in the ass you know it's not gonna it's not gonna help so for me, I think being authentic too is 100%, but that's just me because I don't have patience for BS um, and I don't do well in that environment. So, um, and it's like I said, though, it's taken 30 years for me to kind of at least open up to that line of thinking. I haven't really put it into practice yet. <laughs> so I'll let you know if that ever happens. But I, these are just big picture things that I think could pertain to life and production. Um, and be respectful. My God, just because you don't know somebody or you have, you, you have a preconceived notion about who they are or where they've come from or who, what their intentions are, try before you go to that conclusion to try to put yourself in that person's shoes, especially in a moment of conflict in the office. Um, because if you keep pushing your own thing and you're like, no, I, no one's listening to me. This is all, I know I'm right. I know I'm right. Like after, no one wants to hear that kind of person after a while. Cause it's like, dude, you're not even willing to open up yourself to compromise and conflict resolution, which is like I said, the crux of any production is how well and efficiently and cost effectively and swiftly you can pivot to fix problems. Um, and that's why they come up with that term director's cut, because most of the time what a director either wants or thinks that product should be, sometimes there is a physical product for that, but it's rarely what ends up going out the door. The, uh, countless times and stories of directors who hold their projects way too precious to themselves and fight the studio like my brother did. My brother actually fought. Imagine Entertainment and um, Brian Grazer, who's like one of the biggest producers and production partnerships ever with Ron Howard. And um, he did a movie called Life with Eddie Murphy and Martin Lawrence. And um, Ted was an up and coming director who had predominantly worked on, you know, indie films and was known as this cool dude. And it was like his first after working with Harvey Weinstein at Miramax, um, <clears throat> it was his first taste of like 
working with a big time, like really big time producer that was going to put his needs ahead of Ted's, right? Because it was his show, his film. And um, they had a creative disagreement over the um, trailer for the, or no, for one of the scenes. And uh, Ted had to acquiesce to what, what uh, Brian wanted and he wasn't happy about it. And he, he did it kicking and screaming. And, um, you know, I think it compromises relationship with the guy, but I think at the end of the day, you can't be too precious, if, especially if you're going into feature films. That is a machine that is also self-destructing right now. I mean, you guys know, unless you're a Marvel blockbuster or something rare, like you're not making a lot of money anymore in feature films, especially now, because who's going, no one's going to the theaters. And you've got Netflix and Hulu to contend with. And they're, they've got big budgets and they're doing creative shit that's way cooler than a lot of stuff that the studios are putting out. So anyway, I'm babbling as always. I'm just saying that don't be too precious. Patience, breathe, surround yourself with good people. I and mean, these are just life things, but they can totally be applied to production and, and television. And one thing before I'm going to let you go. Um... I hear the dog in the background. Got to it's see okay. I'm letting him in. Hold on. Got to see. Got to see the dog. I'll try to to tilt it a little bit to him in a second. He's okay. he's he's being a pest. Yeah. Go ahead. It's Sorry. okay. My dog's a barking, saying you were supposed to feed me at four thirty, and now it's almost five o'clock, and they're gonna kill me. Yeah, he's not. He's not doing well with this quarantine thing. I am literally on the phone on these types of things, but for work most of the day, often starting really early because I work with um, people in Europe and they're five, six hours ahead of us. So um, he's, yeah, he's not happy, but he'll get over it. Okay. But yeah, I want to thank you so, so much for coming, being here with us. Thank you. you. Always welcome to our class. I mean, I have people say, I want to contact you. And I said they could contact you through me and I will get in contact. Sure. With you. Um, but I mean, it's been great. I mean, I know I'm talking about from the Cortland people to the class people. Yeah, um, this God. has been absolutely amazing. Uh, this whole process has been amazing. Unfortunately, it had to take this to get us to do this. But it's been, <laughs> I know. It's <clears throat> been absolutely simply amazing. And, and I love you for this. Oh. This, is, this has really been incredible. I've been, I wanted to do this for so long. And this is what brought us together. Uh, and I will tell you, this is not good. We're never getting apart again. This is not, I'm not going to allow that ever to happen again. Uh, <laughs> and seriously, I, I, again, thank you all for tolerating my um, long winded rambling stream of consciousness. It's something I always try to work on and I'm not very good at harnessing it. Um, but I'm glad that um, you guys found some value in some of the things I had to say and that it, it helped and it wasn't just babble, but it is my my uh, story, and there's a lot more to it, and I'm happy to um, stay in touch with, and if there were questions that people either didn't feel comfortable asking or just thought of asking that didn't get the chance, please, like, well, we can stay in touch. Absolutely. I mean, that's part of what I want to do is, is um, help in any way I can. So um, this has been incredibly fulfilling for me, too, and uh, I don't want to get emotionally welled up with my tears but i just between brian and sue and like every it's just like it's it's overwhelming it's been great and all the feedback from your students and all you guys have been awesome thank you if we ever do this again and i'd love to do it again absolutely i will have yeah. a special guest for you that you can never <laughs> believe and i i will i will hit the archives i, I will go to oh all no and you know i will <laughs> and people who know me i know you will out. Um, I know you will. I well, and I'll leave you with two quick things real quick. I know it's five o'clock, past five o'clock. Um, if you guys feel like there could be a specific conversation that's very, like, drills down into something very specific <clears throat> on anything, let me know. And we can look, do, like, a half hour or an hour or whatever on just that. And I will prep so that it stays focused and, and drills down into anything specific. But I want to thank you again. This is our, again. This is our first webinar in the whole school. So I mean, you have I love that distinction it. of being the first. There, there's no brother. There's no uncle. 
It's Jen Demi, who is the first <laughs> to be our first webinar. And um, thank you. That's awesome. I'm excited. Yes, I'm really excited so and I'm honored. And, um, really. Will, the, um, the, the video of this will be posted up there. I will send you a link to the video. So uh, this okay. whole thing has been taped. Uh, I'm sorry. I use the word taped. Did you leave I know. something? Uh, <laughs> but that but it has been. But this has been an incredible time. I want to thank you. Oh, there's the dog. What's what's his or her name? His name his name is Pippin. Hi, Pippin. And he's he's been a very needy puppy. He's 14 years old though, so he's very. I'm his I'm his mama, and I can't go anywhere without him. So he follows me everywhere. That, that's awesome. That's so great. Yes. And, and, well, maybe we'll introduce him to Belly and Button, my my two little doggies right there. You know, who are in that'll the be a separate that'll be a separate webinar. We'll, we'll do that on a personal level. We don't have. To. <laughs> right. I don't think anyone is going to want to sit through that. I don't um, know. They love the dogs. But, but yeah, but, this has been great. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been great for showing up. Uh, I will speak thank to you, you. Later, later on, and uh, we'll talk. Uh, but thank you so much. Anybody has any questions for Jen, please contact me, and I will be sure to forward them over to Jen. Uh, and again, this yeah. is you—you you have an industry person. I won't even say an industry insider. She is an industry person, <laughs> and uh, and we're just so use me, so use me if I can help, um, especially in these times. Um, I, I wish I could say I was hiring. I'm not right now because oh, most of my productions have been stalled except for the two productions that are um, created in the edit and don't hinge on any shoots or anything like that. So those production companies are working remotely. But um, unfortunately, until we know when we're back in business, like I'm not buying any pitches. I'm taking pitches, um, but I'm not buying anything and I can't, you know, plan until we have a game plan right and this is the time for you to start thinking about this time to be creative inside and be ready with those pitches when those times come right and, exactly and this is the time to do it. but again Jen, thank you so so much from the bottom of my heart i love you uh we love all you too you. bye brian you you to you. brian's there and um kim i know who is there too uh, another Cortland alum who uh, just wanted oh, I, to... I didn't see Kim. Oh, next yeah, time. But we, I will make arrangements where Kim will get up there too. All right. Again, awesome. I want to thank everybody. Thanks, Dave. will be up there. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Everybody have a great night and be safe, healthy. And that's most important. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Peace, everybody. Mwah. Thank you again. Thank Bye. You.